All right. All right. Um, honored members of the Broadview community, the Purchase College community, ladies and gentlemen, well, thanks for coming to this session, which is a presentation of a series of uh, six lectures that I'm going to give successively throughout the spring semester. And the first one is uh, the theme of the lectures is exile and displacement, which is connected to my own exile and displacement and a number of other people that we are going to be you know, uh, showing here in these lectures, artists and musicians and people like that who are forced out of their countries because of Islamic militancy. And um, so um, I'll, I'll, mainly it relates to my personal experience of exile in the United States since 1998. Uh, we'll discuss here non-state actors, 9-11 and American policy in that region. And um, I claim that such environments connected to Islamic bigotry, militancy, and violence against citizens affecting international security are the brainchild of the superpowers. As they establish hegemony in critical geopolitical regions, such as Afghanistan and Pakistan. And I'm going to share also some of the research by American writers like Steve Cole and uh, Brzezinski. Uh, about how they're talking about, um, Brzezinski's talking about um, um, American hegemony is very ne necessary in, in, uh, in Asia. And, and he thinks, you know, the, the political center of the world is Asia. And uh, uh, Steve Cole's book, um, share it with you. It's called Ghost Wars. And uh, Steve Cole is a, uh, a journalist for the New York Times. And he spent a long time in, in that region researching the CIA's involvement in what happened in Afghanistan and everything. And it's a page turner. If you really get a chance, please do buy it or you know borrow it from the library. It's written in very simple language and it'll explain to an, a non-informed person like myself also who the political parties were, who the players were, and you know what, what, what happened and Pakistan's involvement in it, mainly the Pakistani military's in, uh, involvement, the uh, inter-service special group, which were trained by the CIA. And uh, so um, it's really a very, very interesting book. And he says here, Ghost Wars, the secret history of the CIA, Afghanistan, and bin Laden from the Soviet invasion to September 10, 2001. And um, this book is also the winner of the, of the Pulitzer Prize. It's one of the bestsellers. So um, I strongly recommend this. And then the other book, um, which I'm going to be referring to, is um, Brzezinski's The Grand, the, the Grand Chessboard which is talking about the great game in Central Asia. And this great game is not something new. This has been going on for 200 years or even more when Britain was involved with the Russians in Central Asia. And uh, so the Brits joined in with, the, with what, the, uh, what we call the Pakhtuns now. And um, there was a lot of intrigue going on. And uh, the British arrived in India in Calcutta, and they traveled all the way, two to 3,000 miles, you know, to get into Afghanistan because of Central Asia, because of its resources. And that great game is still on. Um, and the British were there. Um, they, uh, they made deals with the Afghans, and then they did not uh, keep them up. And in the, at a certain point in time, the Afghans, the Pakhtuns, butchered all the um, um, British and American families who were there. You know, they, they, th they were having a good time. But, you know, they were very angry with, you know, the British promised them, 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 them things. And so, you know, they attacked them. In the end, nobody came back. Everybody who was in Afghanistan was butchered. And they sent back only one doctor on foot to tell the story to the rest of India that who they were. And this is the people that the US is dealing with now. And so this is um, still very current and it will continue to go. And Brzezinski says, 
th this is the great chess board, chess, um, chess board. The chess board is, you know, the great king. He says in the grand chess board, renowned geostrategist, Brzezinski de delivers a brutally honest and provocative vision for American prominence in the 20, uh, preeminence in the 21st century. The task facing the United States, he argues, is to become the sole political arbiter in Eurasian lands. That is, you know, all of Asia, you know, uh, connecting with uh, Europe also, and to prevent the emergence of any rival power threatening our material and diplomatic interests. The, the Eurasian land ma mass, home to the largest part of the people's population, natural resources and economic activity is the grand chessboard, which is also the great king. And you know, that is the area of my research and I have worked on that and I have been involved in it. I have been very much a player of the great king myself, working for the Open University in Islamabad. And in my six lectures, I will successively share my experiences of how we got involved uh, in Afghanistan and the training of people like myself in the United States was very much a part of the great game. We did not realize it until 9-11 happened. And we said to each other, did we know? Did we know that we were also pawns in that game? And even with the international office at the University of Texas or at Austin, where I was, you know, the second time I was in asylum. And we asked the women, did we know? Did we know that we were also, you know, a pawns in that game? Because later on, um, my advisor, who was the advisor to the government of Pakistan and because of whom I and, you know, landed at the University of Texas at Austin, said that the Pakistan government had a written agreement with the University of Texas at Austin in the exchange of scholars, in the ch exchange of materials and everything. So America was coming up as a new superpower, replacing the British. And... Um, in this landmark work of public policy and political science, Brzezinski's, Brzezinski outlined a groundbreaking and powerful uh, blueprint for America's vital interests in the modern world. In a revised edition with a new epilogue, Brzezinski brings his seminal work up to date with commentary on the latest global developments, including the war in Ukraine, the resurgence of Russia and the rise of China. This was the man who was the architect of American's policy in Afghanistan. And there's a very interesting film which we have in the library also. It's called Afghan Women, A History of Struggle. And that also traces all the involvement of the superpowers in Afghanistan. And Brzezinski said to have said, you know, what difference does it make, you know, if a few Pathans got riled up? We riled them up and, you know, we have the hegemony in, in, in Asia. So this was the great game. So, um, so, uh, so my claim is that such environments connected to Islamic bigotry, militancy, and violence against citizens affecting international security are the brainchild of the superpowers as they establish hegemony in critical geopolitical regions, such as Afghanistan, Pakistan, I mean, you know, loosely it's called ASPAC. Pakistan is a part of Afghanistan and geographically also it is a part of Afghanistan. It was separated through the Duran line when the British were there. That's why the Afghanis claim a large part of Pakistan also, the Atak region and everything. And I'll show you in the, uh, in the, in the maps that, you know, we're going to be putting up. So um, this is uh, what uh, the great game is. And this is a map of the region, uh, you know, what we're talking about. This is the, can you see my cursor? This is the region we are talking about, Afghanistan, Pakistan, this whole thing. And uh, so in the 1970s, the Afghans let in the, the Soviets into their country because there was a strong uh, uh, presence of socialists in, uh, in, Afghan, in the Afghan government. And they thought, you know, uh, Afghanistan wasn't doing that well. It was very conservative and uh, uh, it needed more development. So they teamed up with the Soviets and, you know, and different political parties were born as a result of that in Afghanistan. But, and 
the Afghanis did want to connect with the West, you know, to seek help, but uh, they weren't interested, you know, until now, uh, until the, the Soviets really got in here and mainly also because Iran, you know, you see it in dark green. This is a Shia country. All these um, areas, these are Shia areas. And Shiaism is another branch of Islam. And the difference between the Shias and the Sunnis is over the uh, succession of the Prophet Muhammad, that who was to succeed him. So Iran at the moment, and even at that time, was the largest Shia uh, country in that region. And the Shah of Iran, until the 1970s, was an ally of the, of the Western powers, especially America and Britain and everything. And uh, he um, he uh, he allowed them all kinds of, of of rights to to oil and everything. So we see here, you know, this whole region: Afghanistan, uh, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Saudi Arabia. So once the uh, the uh, the Soviets got in, and the Shah was removed in 1978, then the West panicked because their good friend was gone and the Irani ayatollahs took, took over the militants, the, the, the extremists, you know, who are still in control of Iran and they're not letting anybody, you know, get into their territory. So that's when the West, you know, got really upset because the Soviets were here. They had support from, the, from, from Afghanistan and what the Soviets were looking for was a route to the Arabian Sea, to warm waters. And that was a threat, you know, to Saudi Arabia and, you know, Qatar and all these countries. And so a big, you know, expedition was launched. And how was, uh, and it was not just the, U the CIA and the US, it was other European powers also. So how were they going to get into Afghanistan? It had to be a very covert operation. So that co covert operation was contracted through Pakistan, through the Pakistan Army's special branch, which is called the Inter-Services Intelligence, who are trained by CIA. And so in the, in the research it, um, that I have done, for every dollar that the Saudis or the Americans gave, you know, for this war in Afghanistan, only 10% was paid, you know, to the, to the Pakhtuns, you know, who were doing the main fighting. And they were riled up, you know, into a very, very militant, uh, uh, I wouldn't say a tribal tribalism, it wasn't even Islam. So these people were brought on board. And so 90 cents were going to Pakistan's inter-services intelligence, to the Af Afghan warlords, and um, uh, only 10% was going for, 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 for these fighters. So this is how uh, it was it was done, and um, and so you know um, connected to my discourse is the, the the place of the Western press and the academy about the violent politics of Afghanistan Pakistan. For example, I refer to a recent article in the Guardian newspaper of England on November 3, twenty twenty three, where the author Jason Burke draws the chronological events of the assassination of Pakistan's politicians since the country's birth in 1947. He connects it to the recent attempt to assassinate Imran Khan, a former uh, prime minister, and now again a contender for the position of um, uh, prime minister again. Not once does the author mention the significant role of the superpowers in the theater. Not once does the author mention the, the elephant in the room, that is the super, superpowers. Such discourse is perennial. It's not just him. Everywhere, wherever you go, in all forums, you know, they're talking about Pakistan this, Pakistan that, Pakistan nukes, Pakistan army, blah, blah, blah. But nobody talks about the players, the real players in the game and the people that really perpetrated 9-11 themselves. So this is... Um, this is what, you know, my uh, lecture series are about. And this is my research for the last 30 years because I am myself involved in this whole drama. 
Uh, here I will speak of the interactions of the West with the rest and events that happened in South Asia in the regions of Afghanistan and Pakistan since the 1970s to date that led to the events of 9-11 in which thousands were killed and several thousands displaced, not only in the United States, but in the Muslim world in general, leading to the exile of key intellectuals, artists, and thinkers in that part of the world. State-backed Islamic religious groups in, uh, in my open university in Islamabad, where I was a full professor of English and chair of the Department of English, thrust a blasphemy fatwa or charge against me. The fatwa or charge carries a death sentence. It's, no, it's non-bailable. You know, once you're implicated in it, you're not going to get um, a, a bail. And a lot of times, even before the state can do anything, these people are killed by lynch mobs themselves with complete, complete state support. As came seminary educated clerics and then made full professors, some even deans of faculties to Islamicize the universities, these men were threatened with my PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. Their fear was further aggravated by the fact that I had researched women's voices in the Sufi musical traditions of Pakistan and India. That's a no-no with the with the with the diehards sufism or the mystical liberal eclectic islamic practices had never have never gelled with the orthodox establishment the patriarchal pra pra practices of islam also because you see the sufis have not been projected in this whole story of islam you know presented as a as a terrorist religion or whatever Sufis have continuously made fun of these um, diehard mullahs and a lot of the discourse, the poetry and the singing and everything is ridiculing them. It's really ridiculing them, you know, their five times prayers and all that kind of thing. I mean, Sufi singers like Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan is saying in Punjabi, you know, you're praying five times a day, we are praying all the time. So. Uh, this was uh, one of the reasons, uh, you know, for their uh, opposition to Sufism. And it wasn't just in Pakistan that it started. The whole thing started in Turkey, where there were the Bakhtashis. And they were the ones who were ridiculing the, this, this clergy and this orthodox establishment. So... Um, this presentation is about international laws that I derived from my research of a so-called Sharia within inverted commas, you know, uh, uh, you know, claiming that is the Sharia or the jurisprudence of Islam. It's not. It's, it's generated. It's generated by different parties throughout the ages. Muhammad never had a Sharia. He never lived to create a Sharia. He just ruled by customary law or whatever, you know, uh, his uh, revelations uh, were about, you know, different uh, incidents that would happen and he would get a revelation. And then, you know, he would uh, mediate with the tribes, the Arab tribes, the Jewish tribes, the Christian tribes, uh, and uh, uh, come to a consensus. He never had a Sharia. But, you know, these people, you know, associate Muhammad with the Sharia. No, he was not a militant man. And he did not create a Sharia. The Sharia is a creation of the states that followed uh, the death of Muhammad. They were the Khalifs, uh, you know, his successors who claimed divine authority, the three, the four Khalifs. And Ali was the last one in the line. And the difference between the Shia and the Sunni is that according to the Shia, in his last uh, return from Qom Ghadir, Muhammad raised Ali's hand. Ali was his cousin, in, where, you know, in whose house he was raised when his, his parents died when he was very young, and also his son-in-law. And he got the tribes to promise that they will select Ali after he's gone. And, you know, there's a, a, a verse, Man Kunto Mawla for Ali and Mawla, that Muhammad made them say that Whoever's Lord I am, Ali is his, his Lord also. And that is a prime sentence in which, you know, all Sufi performances begin and which is, is really very contentious with um, diehard mullahs and clergies and the likes of them. So 
What I claim is all Islamic jur jurisprudence imposed on citizens in Muslim countries against their will, the subjugation of women's voices and injustices to children and minorities. It will be, ma be mainly about Pakistan's military state and its relationship with its citizenry. It will be about apartheid generated by a Muslim state, military state backed by petrodollars from the Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, you know, all these Gulf states, Qatar and UAE and all these people. And, you know, these are the people that negotiated the settlement, the decent settlement in 2021, you know, uh, getting the U.S. out of uh, Afghanistan. So the West provided the military weaponry and the training of militants or Mujahideen, whom, you know, out of uh, uh, fondness, they used to call Muj, Muj. Uh, they, they, they were their partners, they were their allies. And, you know, this is mentioned in also another um, book, which is called, you know, Charlie Wilson's War. It was made into a film also. And Charlie Wilson was a Texas congressman who supported uh, the, uh, the Mujahideen and everything. And there is a chair named after him at the University of Texas at Austin. So the West provided the weaponry and training of militants or Mujahideen in the 70s for Islam. And according to Charlie Wilson's um, thing about the war, he has given the statistics that $50 million was spent by the US to create manuals in the University of Nebraska to create the Mujahideen. And those manuals are still used by the Taliban in the madrasas and everything. In reality, it was a game for hegemony in the Middle East, South Asia, and the wider Muslim world. The conflict was between the Soviet Union and the West, especially with the United States. The tragedy of Twin Towers gives birth to this research. I have ventured to write accounts of what had been happening outside the United States for almost two decades before 9-11. In countries where CIA funded mercenary armies, the agencies also colluded with seminary mullahs or uh, um, um, uh, clerics or mosque clergy to be held hostage to state laws that cruel military regime upheld in the name of Islam. You know, it, it was imposed. It was imposed by a military regime. I mean, here we talk about, you know, democracy and all that kind of thing. What democracy? Pakistan has a history of at least, you know, 50 to 55 years of military rule since its creation in uh, 1947. And where does it get its military funding? It gets this from the United States. The, large, the three largest recipients of American aid are Pakistan, Israel, and Egypt. At the moment, you know, Pakistanis are um, out of the game, you know, they're, they're out of favor, but it's a, it's a lover's relationship, sometimes on, sometimes not on, you know, and they know it too, because, you know, they claim, yes, they are mercenaries, you know, and they will do anything for money. Okay. So I'm talking about, you know, uh, and I'll uh, uh, read uh, sections from my book also, where I'm talking about the events that were a precursor of 9-11. These, you know, militants were testing the waters. They were testing the waters for many years, but nobody realized it until 9-11 happened. And then, you know, we, we went back. I, I don't think the rest of the world has gone back to see, you know, what was happening. It's my own research and, you know, my own living in the area and dealing with, uh, with this context. Um, among the laws, are the blasphemy laws in Pakistan and the Hadood ordinances, which are laws against women. This meant reducing the worth of a woman's testimony to one half of a man. And in case of rape, she is required to produce four adult male Muslim witnesses to testify on her, on her behalf before rape can be proved. In the absence of these uh, uh, um, witnesses, he is charged with zina or fornication. Where are all these laws coming from? They're not coming from the Prophet Muhammad's Sharia. These are uh, generated and these, the blasphemy law 
in Pakistan and in the rest of the colonies was introduced by the British when they were colonizers there. And the two structures on which Pakistan's blasphemy laws are based on the British blasphemy law. And also reducing a woman's testimony to one a half of a man's is also based on the law of witness that the British you know, brought into the, into the colonies. But they brought in the blasphemy laws because they did not want you know, the different ethnic groups to be fighting with each other, which the military regime appropriated. And they said, oh, we don't have to do anything. You know, we just re-impose uh, re you know, our own version of the Sharia. You know, the, the framework already exists. You know? So we'll create our own Sharia and we'll have our own blasphemy laws. And you know, I'll refer to the, the content of those blasphemy laws also. They were produced in Saudi Arabia by Saudi clerics. And they're very nebulous. So um, th that is what was happening. The punishment ranged anywhere from British public stoning to execution. We've seen these events acted out in Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, and Pakistan's Squat Valley. Female musicians were executed publicly on prostitution charges. In addition, self-appointed vigilantes took the laws into their hands. The case of Mishal, a university student in the northern province of Pakistan, now Khabar Pakhtunkhwa, was beaten to death for blasphemy by his own peers while the administration watched. Similarly, the Af in Afghanistan, a woman was, to, was burned to death for blasphemy as the police stood to watch the theater. The Sri Lankan manager of a factory in Sialkot in Pakistan was torched to death very recently, about a year or two ago. He only took off the posters of some Islamic parties to tidy up for an inspection of the facility. Even Salman Taseer, the governor of the Punjab province, was shot to death by his own bodyguard for trying to repeal the blasphemy laws. Soon after, the Christian minister for minority affairs was shot. Both men were trying to protect a Christian woman, Asya Bibi, who was wrongfully accused of blasphemy. She was the mother of five children who lived on death row for seven years. Can you imagine? And, you know, there is a book that she's written about it. Before the courts released her for incorrect reporting of her case by the police. As a result, the Islamic parties in Islamabad blocked the capital city for several days. The fanatics raised slogans against the judges who acquitted Asya Bibi, calling them apostates. Even the chief of the military, Pakistan military and state ministers were branded as apostates. Uh, um, Asya Bibi's own attorney, you know, who fought her case, just, you know, disappeared in Europe because there were so many uh, threats to his life. Eventually, Asya Bibi was moved to exile in Canada with her family. For fear of the Islamic forces, Theresa May, the British Prime Minister at that time, refused to grant Asya Bibi a, a, asylum because there, there are lots of Muslims, you know, uh, especially Indian and Pakistani Muslims uh, living in Britain. So, you know, she wasn't going to take the risk. So, but Canada, you know, accepted her. The cases of violation of justice in the name of Islam are countless. And let me tell you, this is, this book, well, my book was published in 2013. And, you know, the blasphemy laws had existed even before that. Very recently, in the last two to three weeks, Pakistan's National Assembly has reinforced and made the blasphemy laws even stronger and putting them under um, the criminal law of 2023. They've made an, uh, an amendment to the, to, the, to the constitution and they've made it even more horrendous as if it was not horrendous itself. And you know why they're doing it? Because they're so corrupt. Pakistan has defaulted. The world does not know. Pakistan has defaulted on its loans with the IMF. And well, it's getting almost near the situation of, uh, of Sri Lanka. They're not talking about it, but this is what is happening. I mean, I used to get my pension, you know, about, uh, uh, to, uh, you know, $2,200 or something like that every two or three months for 100,000 rupees, which is a big sum. I only got $350. And the Indian man who gave it to me in Western Union commiserated with me. He says, this is all you're getting for $100,000? I said, yeah, rupees. I said, yes. 
The Indian rupee is 80, 80 rupees to the dollar. The Bangladeshi taka is 80 uh, uh, rupees to the dollar, uh, taka to the dollar. And here we have Pakistan, 257 rupees to get one dollar on the black market. Why? Because Pakistan's politicians, Pakistan's generals, Pakistan's judiciary, you name it, they have plundered the country. They've taken everything. They only come, they plundered the country, and they go back to Europe. And, you know, buy properties in, uh, in, in England, create offshore accounts and everything, and that's it. So no wonder Pakistan has defaulted or is on the way to default, to being defaulted. And we've maintained this for a very long time, the way things are going. Pakistanis are going to be very upset about it and you know they're not going to like what I'm, going, what I'm saying. It's going to fragment. It's going to fragment like Bangladesh. You see when Pakistan was made, this is India. This, this was a complete united unit here. The complete united union. When the British were forced out of India because of Gandhi's wanting them to get out, the British created separate groups, ethnic groups, like they're doing in, uh, in Iraq also, Shia, Sunni, you know, codifying it. They've never been codified. You know, Shias and Sunnis have always interacted with each other. I've had a Shia marriage and I'm a Sunni. It was never an issue. But with the British all, uh, and the colonial powers, it is all being codified. And also the, the, the so-called Sharia is a codification of colonial powers because they want it, you know. I mean, it's easy for them to interpret it, simplify it, reduce it. Islamic law is very sophisticated. It's very sophisticated. It's very nuanced. And it depends on, you know, who is interpreting the law. The British didn't, or the colonists didn't have that sophistication. They didn't have the knowledge. They didn't have the background. So they saw, you know, this is what it is. And, uh, you know, so they, they, create a, they create their own Islamic law. They call it Mohammedan law. So, uh, and the other thing that I wanted to mention was, you see, with this unit here, the India here, this was a united um, area. And a part of Afghanistan is a part of Pakistan also. There is this Durand line. You see this, this, uh, this boundary here? This was never there. This was created by the British to isolate Afghanistan and to create you know, a Pakistan. And why, why was this area fragmented? In 1947, there was a West Pakistan and there was an East Pakistan. Can you believe it? Two, a part of the country in two different units with 15 to 1,500 to 2,000 uh, miles of another country's um, uh, territory. I mean, this is what they did. And they knew what they were doing. So as soon as uh, they left, and why was Pakistan created? Pakistan was created as a buffer strait as a buffer straight state to oppose uh, the, the, the Russians here, the Soviets here. And they, they played upon the sentiments of the, of, of the Muslims, you know, look, you know, you're Muslims and look at these Hindus, you know, they're not you know, giving you your rights and et cetera, et cetera. And they set up people like Jinnah, who was the founder of Pakistan and Yaqat Ali Khan, you know, to claim a Muslim identity. There was this issue was never an issue. I mean, Muslims and Hindus and Christians had lived together for thousands of years. There was never an issue. But this is the, the ploy of colonial powers. Divide the countries, you know, divide the communities and everything. And so Pakistan was created as a buffer strait, state, state, you know, to keep an eye on Russia here and the Soviets. They left India alone because India was coming up with this own socialist uh, um, 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 constitution. You could not own more than 10 acres, even if you were a Maharaja or a king or whatever, you know, I mean, in, as soon as, you know, they started talking about uh, the partition, 
I mean, India, India went socialist and they were allies with the, with the Soviets and they still have a very good relationship. Whereas Pakistan is a, is a, is a country of landlords, of, of landed gentry created by the British who gave them huge tracts of land and, you know, made them into all these uh, Khans and Pathans and Sayyids and what have you. So it, this was created as a buffer state. But what happened was that the Pakistani military army, as I have said, you know, I mean, in the 75 years of its existence, you know, for more than 50 years, it's been run by the military. I mean, they're still there, but the generals have become very sophisticated now. They don't bring in martial laws like that, you know. This, the, the, the proper puppet po politicians like in Imran Khan and all these others. So what happened was that the military was and the generals were appropriating all the resource here, resources here of East Pakistan for, for a very, very long time. And, you know, there was a, a discrimination against them because they were a darker people, you know. Oh, I mean, you know, these Bengalis, you know, what do they know? You, uh, but, you know, but Bengal had uh, still has a very high literacy rate, much, much more than Pakistan. And so eventually the long and short of it is there were so many violations of justice and everything that the election in 1971 and before that a, a cyclone had happened. So at that time, General um, Yahya Khan uh, was, uh, you know, in charge of everything. And the, the, the Bengali leader, the Mok, uh, Mujibur Rahman, he won the, the election because although it was a smaller country, you know, the population was very large and they, they won more seats than the politicians here in West Pakistan, especially Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, who claimed to be, a, you know, socialist and all that. He refused to go to Dhaka for a, a, a session of the, uh, of the National Assembly. It was the right of the of the uh, of the East Pakistanis to to establish, you know, a government of a government and, you know, be the policymakers even for West Pakistan. This was not acceptable to Bhutto and, you know, the others. And so they said, all right, you know, I mean, and civil war started and everything. And, you know, there were issues of language and culture and all that kind of thing. I mean, even Jinnah, when I look at him, the founder of Pakistan, he was so naive. He said, you know, if when Pakistan is created, Arabic is going to be the national language. Come on. How can the Arabic be a, the, the national language? I mean, it has to be one of the, you know, the, the indigenous languages and English or something like that. And this, that, that is the official language in Pakistan and India. But, you know, there were all these language issues and issues of culture and all. And as usual, the, the, the boots, as I call them, you know, they, they just got in there and, you know, there was a civil war and all kinds of atrocities were committed. And in the end, you know, with support from India, India's Mukti Bahini, East Pakistan became Bangladesh. They had had enough. They had had enough. And now their economy is doing much, much better than West Pakistan. They have taken away the name of the Islamic Republic of Bangladesh out. Wherever you have the Islamic Republic of so-and-so, the mullahs take over. They think, you know, they have the right. But they said, all right, you know, we're taking this Islam thing out and we are just the Republic of Bangladesh. And, you know, uh, they, have, they have created their own laws. It's not that, you know, a woman's testimony is, uh, is half of a man's or, you know, a woman only gets, you know, half of the share of what a man gets. So, you know, it's, it's equally distributed. They have adjusted two modern times, the Bangladeshis, and you know, their economy is thriving. It's thriving. India's economy is thriving. Here is Pakistan. I am, I've, I mean, I'm giving you the latest news after, you know, that I've written the book. Pakistan is waiting for IMF to come and sanction them alone. And they were, you know, acting very hoity with, uh, with, with IMF, you know, uh, their ministers and all that. I am an international monetary fund said, you know, okay, we're not coming. We're not coming until you implement, you know, the directions we've given you, raise the taxes, collect the taxes, you know, and do this, that, the other. They didn't do it. They thought they were very smart addicts. 
They said, all right, we're not coming. And, you know, the Pakistanis were very confident of their buddies in, you know, Saudi Arabia and UAE and China and everything. And everybody said, no, unless the IMF approves it, you're not getting anything from us. So there's a stalemate now. We don't know where it's going to go. And my thing is, as I've said, it's not a question of if. It's going to be when it will happen, the fragmentation of West Pakistan. There's going to be a Balochistan. There's going to be a Punjab on its own. There's going to be a Sindh on its own. And Karachi, you know, is going to belong to the, to the refugees who came from, from India at the time of the partition. And, you know, when all this was being talked about, the creation of Pakistan and separating from India and everything, there were differences between uh, uh, Jinnah and, and Nehru. Because, you know, Jinnah wanted to become the prime minister and Nehru wanted to be the prime minister. And Gandhi, the poor man, you know, was trying to negotiate between both of them. And Gandhi is very popular with the Indian Muslims. He's very popular. They, they, they say that he was being very fair and he got killed because he was going to come to Pakistan and talk about the division of assets to, you know, what Pakistan is going to get, you know, from the joint treasury. And then he got killed by uh, the Shiv Sina, you know, who are the BJP now. And when all this was happening, there were a lot of Muslim leaders, you know, Maulana Azad, the Ali brothers and everything. They kept saying to Jinnah and all these people, don't do it. Don't create a separate Pakistan. Because you know what's going to happen? India is going to become a Hindu India only. And this is what we're seeing happening with BJP. They're persecuting the Muslims. You know, they don't want them there. They say, you know, you made Pakistan go to Pakistan. But Pakistan is not going to take them. Pakistan has refused to take its own refugees from the Swatua Valley. You know, when uh, there, there was a lot of, you know, uh, uh, up, 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 uprising uh, from the Taliban in, um, well, when was it, 2005 and things. And going back to the Taliban, the Taliban are standing at Pakistan's borders only 90 miles away. Because since the creation, I mean, the, the resurgence of the Taliban in Afghanistan, you know, after the U.S. left in 2021, uh, there's a Pakistani Taliban also. They call themselves Tahrik Taliban Pakistan. You know, all the remnants of the parties, the Islamic parties that were created, you know, during the, uh, during the, the, you know, this whole difference with, uh, with uh, the, uh, Soviet, with the Soviets, with the Western world. So um, now they, they have gotten together and the, what the Taliban are demanding, the Afghani Taliban and the Pakistani Taliban, they're saying, all right, you know, we are going to remove this Duran line. You know, this is an artificial creation where we're, you know, we're coming here. And what is already happening is very much like uh, Somalia, uh, the uh, Pakhtunkhwa province, you know, the northern province of Pakistan is in the, in the hands of the, uh, of the TTP, the Tariq Taliban Pakistan, and they're threatening that they're going to come and take over Islamabad and they're going to impose their own Sharia. Which means, you know, the women are going to be put in burqas, like, you know, it happened uh, in Afghanistan and they're not going to be allowed to work. And they did try it. They did try it earlier on also by chasing women like me and others out of the country. The Afghan Taliban did it in a very crude kind of a way. You know, they just locked up women and said they couldn't be doctors and, you know, they couldn't do this, that and the other. And many professional women committed suicide because of that. They couldn't do that in Pakistan because Pakistan has a very secular constitution. But they used other means, you know, just harass these women, harass them, you know, so that they leave. And I was not the only one who left the Open University. Many others left. I mean, an institution which was a secular institution, the Open University, established by the British Open University in England and producing 80 to 90,000 students every semester because it, has a, it had a distance teaching education system. It had regional offices everywhere. And this was for a second chance education. But you know what happened? 
the clerics in the university saw the viability of what the university could do, they appropriated it. They chased out, out you know, all the women, all the secular people, and, you know, and they said, we are going to bring in our own Darsa Nizami. Darsa Nizami is a, you know, is a seminary uh, curriculum. So they did it with support from the, from, from, from the government because there was a lot of money coming from Saudi Arabia and uh, the UAE. And in 1984, when, 85, when I left Pakistan uh, to go and do my PhD in, uh, at the University of Texas at, at Austin, I mean, Islamabad was a glitzy bonanza place, you know, for all these Afghani uh, leaders come, you know, Hikmat, Hikmat Yar and, you know, Rabud, Rabab, Rabbani and all these people, very, very right, right when, you know, retrograde mullahs. So they were being wined and dined by Pakistan through the funds and the training that were, that was provided by CIA, I'm sorry to say, you know, but that's the honest truth. And that's what, you know, Steve Cole is saying, and that's what Brzezinski is saying. So this is what was happening. And so uh, successively, Pakistan went towards Islamization. And that, I, you know, many scholars have called the Islamization or the colonization of Islam in Pakistan. All the universities were taken over by the mullahs. There were no... Uh, union student unions or or anything and even now even now with um, imran khan you know who was a playboy prime minister as a cricketer world-class cricketer uh he he suddenly become a mullah he's carrying on you know his beads and everything and they call him taliban khan why taliban khan because he's hoping he's colluding with the uh with the talibans here hoping one day you know that he's going to be one of them. Well, he's sadly mistaken. He's not going to be one of them. It's going to be them, themselves. And this is what they're doing. So the Pakistani military, you know, created, you know, this, uh, this whole thing in Afghanistan. And I'm sorry to use the language, you know, it's a language, a very crude language, you know, uh, penetrating, penetrating into, into Central Asia. This is the language they use. And the language is the language of occupation. And I'm saying that because I've dealt with them. I used to rent my house to all these, you know, brigadier generals and what have you. And the first thing they would come is, when can we occupy the place? When can we occupy the place? I said, no, you cannot occupy the place. You have to first go and get a lease before I let you occupy the place. That's their language. So I'm, I'm coming to uh, all this. Um, so considerable number, this, this is what happened. It was during Prime Minister Roshar Ali Bhutto's government, a so-called socialist leader that in the 1970s, under pressure from the Islamic parties and some Arab states, Pakistan declared the Ahmadiyya community as non-Muslims. They were Muslims. They were doing everything, you know, that Muslims do, prayer, fasting and everything, except that they had a separate religious leader. Well, don't the Ismailis have a separately uh, religious leader? They're not persecuted, but these people were persecuted. Considerable numbers of Ahmadiyya Muslims live in exile in the West or undercover in Pakistan. This marked the beginning of draconian laws being instituted in Islam's name that later General Ziaul Haq imposed on the citizenry after he declared martial law. With support from the West, he overthrew the democratically elected Prime Minister Zulfikar Ali Bhutto and in order to become the president of Pakistan in 1977, he joined hands with the Islamic parties, the Jamaat Islami and all these other people, you know, things, you know, who've always had the blessings of, of, of the West. Bhutto was later executed. His daughter, um, uh, Benazir Bhutto, was assassinated, you know, in 2010, 2009, 2009 uh, by these Taliban. She was so popular. They had sharpshooters you know, from the Pakistani military and then they shot her down. She was the only hope for Pakistan, a Western educated woman from Ratcliffe and you know, president of the Oxford Union and everything. They shot her. And the blasphemy law was also instituted to keep tabs on women like Benazir Bhutto. They didn't want a woman prime minister. 
Okay, briefly, none of these laws come from the Quran nor the Prophet Muhammad's practices. They are a violation of social justice or Muhammad Sharia or Islamic law. The so-called Sharia is a creation of the Islamic states that rose after Muhammad's death. The biographical data of the Prophet Muhammad's life does not support any of the laws that we are discussing here. In modern times, perpetrators of laws are states like Pakistan, Afghanistan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Bangladesh. The cronies are the Islamic political parties, and I again say in uh, inverted commas, you know, Islamic. The virus is widespread. In this research of the so-called Sharia, including the blasphemy laws, I revisit the past. I see my own place in the politics of the region, that is Pakistan and Afghanistan. As well, I, was, I will explore the events at the, as they played out from 1978 to the, pre, to the present. This includes non-state actors, 9-11, the London blast, the Madras blast, and countless militant activities in Europe in recent years. The violence from militants in Muslim societies themselves is startling. I shall discuss this in greater detail in a follow-up presentation in digital media and my own brush with the blasphemy laws. What of, is of significance is that the so-called Islamic laws, especially the blasphemy laws, were issued under General Ziaul Haq in the 1970s and the 80s for geopolitical control of the region that also included Afghanistan. The Communist Soviet Union was the cap and the capitalist West thrashed out their differences in Afghanistan. This orthodox version of Islam was implemented in order to bring down the Soviet Union, a defeat that finally broke up the Soviet Union, but kept the United States engaged in the, in the region for an additional four and a half decades. This was the longest war the US fought. Per President Biden's claim that the US incurred $2 trillion in Afghanistan with no positive outcome. To put the record state, none of these $2 trillion was spent on Afghan citizens. They were appropriated by the US's two governments of Hamid Karzai and Ashraf Ghani, the Afghan warlords, Pakistan's inter-services intelligence, but most of all the US contractors and the military industrial complex as General uh, Eisenhower called it. You know, when Afghan, uh, Ashraf Ghani was leaving in 2021, he took every cent, all the dollars, all the foreign exchange, you know, from the treasury of Afghanistan in his plane, so much so there was so much in it, you know, that the dollars at the foreign currency were, were flying over the, uh, uh, the, the airport. There wasn't room to put them in. That's why Afghanistan is so broke now. The Talamanization of Pakistan state in which it regressed into medieval Arab practices was because of the US-Soviet conflict. Afghanistan and Pakistan were the frontline fighters for a proxy war in the region between two superpowers. And you know, I've shown uh, the Steve Cole's book, Ghost Wars, and it's a gripping uh, narrative of the secret history of the CIA. The dream of a caliphate in which the nizam -e mustafa or the model of Muhammad's governance was, pro was proclaimed is born of this adventure. You see, what happened was bin Laden and all these people were allies of the, of the West, of the CIA, and they were promised certain things that when, you know, things settle down, they're going to have their own caliphates. You know, bin Laden is going to have his own caliphate, you know, in Yemen and Mullah Umar is going to have his own, you know, uh, caliphate in, uh, in, in Afghanistan. And Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was going to have his own caliphate in, um, in Iraq. But none of this happened. Amir al-Mu'mineen or the leader of the faithful, that's what uh, General Zia haq declared himself, Amir al-Mu'mineen, you know, that he's a representative of God. Mullah Umar later in Afghanistan assumed the same status. Bin Laden and Abu Bakr, Al-Baghdadi in Iraq had the same dream. Such a dream was underwritten by the CIA. The nizam -e mustafa was adopted by the Khalifs or the rulers who followed Muhammad, as I have said early. A Khalif is a, the leader of an Islamic state ordained with divine powers. Now again, you know, to use a very, very um, stark language, which might not be very polite, when 9-11 happened, 
my one of my senior colleagues who was also my neighbor, you know, in an office at the University of Texas, Dorset, he came to me and said, Shamin, what is it that makes these people feel that they've been had? That's, and they really feel that they've been had. Promises were made to me. And, you know, General uh, uh, President Bush going around saying, you know, they don't like our way of life. No, it's not that they don't like your way of life. It's that because you made sort of false promises to them and you're not telling your people, you know, what promises you made. And I'm going to read, you know, from my book, you know, what was happening. With a population bursting at more than 200 million, a literacy rate of 56% and public expenditure on education as low as 2.6 to 1.8% of the gross domestic product in Pakistan, both the blasphemy laws and the Hudud ordinances against women have been used by the state against the virtually illiterate citizenry, minorities, and intellectuals who could question the state's tyranny or its claim to being Islamic. You know, all these things, cutting off of hands, chopping off of hands, hanging people. This is not, it's not coming from Muhammad. It's not coming from the Quran. These are stories in the Quran. Because the Quran is built on different narratives from Jude, from the Torah, from Christianity. And so I've researched it. And I've researched it with guidance from a very, you know, known scholar of Sufism, uh, Louis Magnion. And he says that, and then I went and looked into the Quran. These, the Quran is telling stories, you know, of what used to happen under the pharaohs. But you go and talk to somebody, you know, to a mullah, to the government, you know, that, you know, this is nonsense. They chop your head off. Oh, but the Quran is saying it. How dare you question the Quran? Well, I mean, the, you know, the Quran is, is full of narratives. So, this is a narrative in the Quran, but that doesn't mean, you know, it's advocating, you know, that you're going to go start, you know, hanging people, chopping their hands, you know, chopping their noses and everything. But this is what it has come to. The same is the situation in Afghanistan. The states and forces of these laws, such as the Taliban, are equally illiterate. Thus, they have delivered a Sharia that is nothing but naked brutality as seen in Afghanistan today. Earlier, the same brutality was enforced in Swat and Waziristan. The Taliban have recently returned in the region. And like I said, you know, they're standing only 90 miles away from the state capital, Islamabad. The male mullah and military collusion has been anything but democratic and in total violation of ethical or Islamic laws, norms. Although in undivided India, up to 1947, the Islamic parties opposed the creation of the Pakistani state, they moved to Pakistan and gave battle here. And I'm quoting, you know, Tariq Ali on this. He says that in his clash of fundamentalisms. You know, there's a clash of fundamentalism from, from, the, from, from the, the Muslim countries and also from the West. Moving forward, my role in this theater started in 1980 when I was selected to work for the Open University in Islamabad. I had recently returned from a teaching assignment in the Girls College of Education in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. Maybe I was a suitable CAD candidate with Islamic credentials from Saudi Arabia, as well as a master's degree in English from secular England to deliver a contemporary Islamic package to the country. As a coordinator of the retraining of English faculty in the country, we were, who, were, were still embedded in the British colonial English we delivered a new modern language-based diploma in the teaching of English as a foreign language. This was with funding from USAID and England's Overseas Development Agency. We retained trained close to 3,000 faculty in five years from, from all over the country. Like I said, you know, I mean, it had a very big outreach. It still has a very big outreach, only, you know, the outreach is in the hands of the, of the clerics. However, over the years, while I was in the US for a PhD, the university's distance learning system was taken over for disseminating the Darsa Nizami or a seminary-based curriculum. That reminds me, you know what is happening in Pakistan now is everybody is, right, is trying to ride, uh, ride the Islam wagon. They made it compulsory for people to read the Quran even when they're doing their bachelors, even when they're doing their masters. 
and you know, magistrates are going into schools, checking on women teachers, you know, how they're teaching, why their, uh, uh, their backpack is sitting on the, on the floor, you know, because it's the Quran in it. And it's become a police state. The only good education anybody can get in Pakistan now is, you know, going to private schools, private universities. But, you know, who can afford them except the elite? Everybody else, you know, just has to toe the line. And, you know, there's been so much brainwashing going on. Uh, you don't even want to talk to anybody about it. Pakistan by now had colonized the very system in the entire educational system. Although Islam is not mutually exclusive with secularism or modernity, its rich, diverse culture was taken over by the cleric's version of an orthodox and exclusively religious text-based Islam. It was in 1998 that I was falsely accused of make, making derogatory remarks against the Prophet Muhammad and the Quran. That charge led to my exile in the United States, where I rebuilt my academic life with support from my alma mater, the University of Texas, and Purchase College. Here, the position on which I'm now a full professor was arraigned by the scholars at risk and the Institute for International Education. The American Academy made me a true scholar of Islam with two books on the subject, numerous articles and lectures all over America and Canadian universities, presenting the true spirit of the Abrahamic faith. We are not terrorists and neither are we creators of terrorism. The honor goes to the Gulf states, the Pakistani inter-services intelligence, the Afghan war warlords, backed by the CIA. Um, I'm going to uh, read some excerpts from my book, you know, in which I am saying, you know, talking about the events that were happening because before um, 9 uh, 11 happened. So, this is my book. In 1998, warnings of 9-11. As I visit, revisited, revisit that period of 1998 in which the blasphemy charge was brought against me and others, such as Dr. Yunus Sheikh, I mean, these are all intellectuals and scholars, and a woman colleague, Dr. Suraya Shafi, who had a PhD in English from England and was teaching at the Government College University in Lahore. Academics generally in the country were targets of the blasphemy charge as detailed in the back materials of the book, of this book. Uh, other world events were playing out too, and such events were a warning of the 9-11 catastrophe. I connect the following events with the takfir ideology in which one Muslim declared another a heretic or a Muslim a fundamental in Muslim declared uh, a non-Muslim a heretic, derived from Pakistan's blasphemy laws that were precursors of what was to come. Number one, the bombing of the American embassy in Nairobi, the bombing of the American embassy in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, the killing of a faculty member at Kabul University, and state-supported terrorism in Pakistan as evidenced by the following incidents. Mullahs or clerics of religious parties threatened to close women's NGOs in the northern western parts of Pakistan. The Sharif government, you know, who are still in power in Pakistan, revoked the licenses of 2,000 NGOs. Mullahs threatened to kidnap women of the NGOs and then forcibly marry them. Bishop Jis uh, Joseph committed suicide by sh shooting himself in Pakistan, Sahiwal, Sessions court because he was unable to get the release of a parishioner sentenced to death for blasphemy. Then there was a state confrontation between the Sharif government and the secular English press when Najam Sethi, the editor of Pakistan Times and journalist Afridi of the Frontier Post and Hassan Akkani were arrested. It was a full-blown confrontation of the secular press with the government. Another thing, Pakistan blasted its nuclear device in the Changi Hills of Balochistan in response to India testing its nuclear arsenal in Pokhran. They're very proud of their nukes, very proud of their nukes, although they, they don't even have enough bread to eat. The other thing is the Taliban in Afghanistan blew up the Bamiyan Buddhas. They said, you know, what good are these Buddhas when our children are, are starving? And they had a point of view. And last but not least was the blowing up of the SS coal 
uh, which was an American uh, ship, uh, which was uh, refueling in Aden, and uh, it was blown up. My question is this, did the donor agencies that were involved in terminating the Cold War during the late 1970s collude in the imposition of such laws in the country or did they simply not care? Was it convenient for the donors to look the other way as long as agendas were implemented in the military and mullah collaboration? <laughs> The generic CIA is well known as a virtual government within a government. The State Department and National Security Council led by advisor Brzezinski, you know, he was advisor under uh, gender, um, President Carter, uh, who provided unlimited funds to the Pakistani military, especially to the inter-services intelligence, whose head of this at that time was General Gul Hamid. General Hamid has significant connections to the Saudis and the Mujahideen. Thus, a powerful conglomerate of do donor agencies was created from the US Agency to, for International Development and its many affiliates to the Jihadi Madrasa organization, whose materi materi materials to indoctrinate the Mujahideen were produced by the CIA and the University of Nebraska at an approximate cost of $50 million. The Mujahideen, now the Taliban, still use the same values for, for their training. I mean, you know, there's a, oh yes. And then I have to share this, um, this poster with you, which is very ironic of what was happening in the country at that time. I mean, there is no creator. We, we couldn't find, you know, who the creator of this poster is. But uh, a lot of my research on Pakistan's blasphemy laws I collected from the internet because I researched in Columbia, in the Columbia Library, the UT Library and everything, because it's such a current issue, you know, they don't have much in there, but I was able to get very useful information on the internet. Now, this is a poster. It says, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah in the name of God, the, of, uh, the great, and there is no God but God. You know, this is the first tenet that a Muslim child is, uh, uh, trained to say and it's you know it's uh, um, sung to him at the time of his birth in between we have the quran you know as uh, as a symbol of justice and then we have these weighing scales you know of the islamic state you know how fair it is this is an image of uh, the the kaaba you know which is the holy shrine of muslims and you know where they perform hajj and all these things this is the prophet muhammad's um, tomb in Medina. And then we have the head of a very known film star, Rohid Murad. He's put, portrayed as a drunk. In fact, you know, there was so much persecution of artists at that time that Rohid Murad couldn't get any work in Pakistan and he committed suicide. This is a famous woman uh, actress, Zeba. She's shown as a prostitute. And then we have, you know, this, this fellow, you know, with the sword in his hand, you know, um, you know, handing out corporate punishments, knocking off, you know, chopping off a head, chopping off hands, you can see all that. And at the bottom is the state, you know, a very fair state, you know, where the lion and the lamb drink from the same water. So uh, I thought, you know, I'll share it with, with my audiences here. And... Uh, you know, going back to the lifestyle of Pakistani generals, at the moment, there is so much anger in Pakistan against, you know, these ruling elite who have, you know, drained the country of everything that, you know, one of the senators was standing there and he said, even American generals don't live the lifestyle that Pakistani generals are living. And it's a fact. They're living in these huge forts, you know, with lights and everything and guards and whatnot and whatnot. And even when they retire, they get a duty-free Mercedes, six servants, a cook, a waiter and a steward and what have you and everything. And you feel like asking them, what have you done? What have you achieved for the country? You ran away from Bangladesh. You know, people, they don't, they don't want to resurrect it or, you know, I mean, they... 
the memory is so short. I mean, they left their boots behind in Bangladesh and 90,000 Pakistanis were taken prisoner by India. And General Niazi, who was a, a, a colleague at uh, Sandhurst with Manik Shaw, and, you know, uh, he just surrendered, finished. That was it. And nobody questioned him. He's living in style in Lahore, you know, with a bungalow and what have you and everything. What for? What have you done? You, you just, you know, left your boots behind. Uh, 80, 90,000 people, you know, were imprisoned and came back. And also the other anger against the U.S. also is that Pakistan has paid a very big price for this involvement. It's become a terrorist state because so many drugs and everything were coming in. And eight, Pakistan has sacrificed 80 to 90,000 citizens of its own in this Afghan uh, 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 um, US uh, CIA war. So uh, there's a lot of anger and there's a lot of very anti-American feeling in the country. So I guess, you know, I've said mostly what I wanted to say and I'll take questions now. No questions? Nobody has any questions? I have a comment. <laughs> uh, and my comment just is uh, really, um, uh, I just learned so much today, uh, Dr. Avas. <clears throat> um, for me, um, you know, this is an area of the world that uh, I'm not very familiar with. But as I know, you and I have a lot of interest in uh, 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 gender equity and uh, uh, gender violence and a lot of these uh, topics. This was the first time, you know, to hear um, from your perspective, sort of this broader historical picture. So I don't really have a question, but more of a comment and uh, and to thank you so much for uh, thank you. Thank the you. opportunity to hear from, uh, from someone who has uh, lived it and not just written about it. Yeah, and this is my book. This was the first book I published, and this is coming out of my PhD di uh, dissertation, The Female Voice in Sufi Ritual Devotional Practices of Pakistan and India. And my PhD dissertation is even a bigger um, project. It's here. Uh, and I've done a lot of research, a lot of research uh, backing up what I'm saying. And I will be talking more about this book and the role of women in uh, mystical songs and their participation in, um, in the rituals of Islam, so much so that Pakistani musicians and Indian musicians also, when they you know, present their discourse, they are singing in women's voices. They're taking on the voice of the woman. They were the people you know, that spoke for the women. And I have a whole uh, um, uh, uh, lecture on that, which I'd share with, uh, with all of us. And I hope, you know, people will enjoy it because I've brought in excerpts from um, Indian, um, Indian Bollywood um, movies and uh, media materials, you know, with Lata Mangeshkar singing here and all these other myths of women, brave women who eloped with their lovers, defying their communities. What are these people talking about? You know, women in grey burqas. This is a stereotype. This is a stereotype the, the West has made. All they can think about is a grey burqa. I tried to get a grey burqa, burqa. You go to Pakistan, you never, you, you won't find a grey burqa anywhere. I got mine from Amazon when I was teaching my Islam courses. Uh, it was, you know, about uh, the, um, um, uh, about your women's place in Islam and everything. And I think I'm going to share those burqas also here <laughs> when we, we talk about it. So uh, it's, not, it's not that. I mean, uh, they're very emancipated women in Pakistan. And, you know, every time they say, you know, Muslim women are oppressed, Muslim men, this, that, and the other. Do I look oppressed? I ask my students, do I look oppressed? There are thousands like me in Pakistan. But this is the stereotype that the Western media has portrayed. Terrorists and, you know, uh, repressors of women and all that kind of thing. And, you know, the poor Muslim woman. The Muslim woman is not poor. She's a very intelligent woman. She's a very intelligent woman. And she's the one who makes the decisions in the family. So, I mean, like in Qatar, it's the, it's the Sheikha. 
the, the, the sheikh's wife who's making all the decisions. He's just letting the, the men, you know, in, in the forefront, but she's the woman, you know, who's making all the decisions. She's a graduate of the University of Beirut, very educated woman and uh, doing a lot uh, for women in, in Qatar. And, and Qatar is a very emancipated country. I mean, they also claim to be Wahhabis. Them and the Saudis are, are relatives. The Qataris say, you know, we are Wahhabis and, uh, you know, uh, our version of Islam is not like the Saudi version of Islam. And Abdul Wahhab never did any of the things that the Saudis are doing. You know, it's all their own tribalism. And their version of Islam is very emancipated. You go to Qatar, you know, you'll see women, you know, in dresses, shorts and everything. But their own women, you know, take on the burqa and all that kind of thing. It's much more emancipated than Saudi Arabia. And I did work in Saudi for a whole year. So no more questions. There are some comments in the chat. Um, just a lot of thank yous and truly just how illuminating this session has been and how educational it has been. Thank you. And how it's fostered curiosity in further research about these topics. I'm glad. I'm glad. Well, that's what my students say, you know, because when they come to my class, I ask them, you know, why are you here? They say, we want to know the truth. Why do you want to know the truth? Because we know our governments are not telling us the truth. These are young Purchase students. And I must say, I have to thank Purchase, you know, for giving me the opportunity to teach here and teach Islam classes and everything. I came here only on an, a 10-month contract through the scholars at risk and the Institute of Education, International Education. And this is my 19th year here at Purchase. Because well, I'll, I'll say as president of the college, it's been our privilege uh, to be able to be here, to listen to your scholarship tonight and to have you uh, be part of uh, expanding our knowledge about a region of the world so many of us are uh, uh, really uh, not equipped to even understand. So thank you. But thank you for coming because my the other five lectures, uh, you'll find them very interesting because I'm bringing in cultural examples of music and uh, the, 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 the tradition, you know, the Indian and Pakistani traditions and everything. So it's going to get more and more interesting. You know, this is only the, uh, the introduction, but towards the end, I mean, uh, there's a whole concert uh, in Dubai and I, I think if people will enjoy it. Well, I have it on my cal calendar, so I plan to be there. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Good night. Good night. Bye -bye. Thanks for coming. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Ren. Hi, Shamindi. Thank you. Hi, how are you? It was lovely seeing you, Gaurav. You have a saying here.